Hello and welcome to episode 29 of MMO Weekly, presented as always by MetsmerizedOnline.com. I'm your host, Sal Manzo, along with my co-host and MMO executive editor, Mike Mayer. And Mike, uh, somehow, some way, in the literally in the middle of the night, Carlos Correa is a New York Met. Um, none of this feels real. I, I don't know what to say. Uh, went to bed last night and was thinking maybe they'll trade for Liam Hendricks. Woke up this morning, they got a new third baseman. So just let me get your initial thoughts and reactions to what's you know capped off here. Just an amazingly unprecedented offseason for the Mets. Yeah, I mean, I woke up to my alarm at 5 a.m. this morning, and uh, I was just like, what are all these notifications? Like, I, I stayed up fairly late anyway. Just got, I, I was kind of just wondering if – Korea, like if that deal with the Giants was going to get worked out last night, like that's the assumption, right? Is that it was just going to get worked out. Um, it would be a small, it'd be a little less money or a few less years with the Giants and everything would work out. And then as the night went on, it was like, well, this is Boris. Um, and maybe something, something wonky could happen here. Um, and if it does, I mean, certainly the Mets would be involved. I mean, we knew, we knew the Mets had interest there, but for, I think the craziest thing is just how quickly it came together after falling apart, right? I mean, that's the big story that everyone's talking about is not only that this fell apart on the day of the press conference that the Giants were supposed to have, um, but it also kind of got finished on that same day, depending on what time zone you live in. Um, so... Yeah, it's just a wild series of events that ends up with the Mets having two of the best shortstops in baseball, um, two good friends from Puerto Rico that have always wanted to play together, um, and they needed the gazillionaire owner to make it happen. I mean, let's face it, he made it. He's Cohen's the reason why Lindor is still here. I mean, they could have traded for Lindor and he could have left. Um, but they gave him the massive extension, for ten years, three hundred forty-one million, and now they brought in uh, Carlos Correa for twelve years, three hundred fifteen million. I mean, just just think about those numbers. Um, those are the payrolls under the Wilpons didn't even like come close to those numbers, um, and, and we're talking about spending that on the left side of the infield. I mean, the Mets' left side of the infield is over $650 million. Um, it's just crazy. I mean, we we can go through like some of the stuff that happened and how it happened, but I, I just, I mean, it shocked, it shocked baseball, it shocked Mets fans. Um, and of course, kind of like the wonky time of it. I think it was like 2.53 Eastern time mm -hmm. when Heyman ended up tweeting it when, I mean, seemingly very few people were, awake on the east coast and it just so it, a lot of people are waking up to it i i mets officials there's people high ranking mets officials that woke woke up to the news uh buck showalter woke up to the news he had no idea um and he still didn't until his wife said something to him i was like um i think you guys signed Korea, and he's like i don't i i haven't heard about that yet and so i mean Buck Showalter just was eating breakfast and had no idea at what taken place. So it's just a wild series of events and obviously a big home run for the Mets. I mean, they, they, I think what kind of gets lost is that the Mets were one of the best offenses in baseball last year. Uh, they were fifth in runs. Um, and now they just, they just had a huge, huge upgrade at third base. Yeah, you know, you mentioned as far as, you know, this is kind of that the piece that the Mets were missing. As far as last year goes, you know, everyone thought the the lack of urgency at the deadline for a bullpen arm was going to, you know, kind of bite them. Uh, I know that we talked at length about that. And ultimately, for an offense that was so good for a 162-game season, they got out slugged against the Padres. And it looked as though that that last power piece was, you know, the the last, you know, link in the, in the chain, so to speak. And Correa fits that perfect. I mean, listen, you know, not only do I think that it'll help him health-wise a little bit, playing third base now the rest of his career, we think you'll hopefully get a little, little more healthy out of him there. Um, 
he's a guy now. He doesn't have to be the dude, right? You know, going to, originally going to San Francisco that whole week, we'll obviously always remember a great week for the Giants. You know him. I hope whoever bought those customized jerseys uh, over the last week, I feel really bad for. But, um, you know, that was a guy that the Giants brought in to be a linchpin, a centerpiece, right? And while Correa has that postseason pedigree, and I think more than anything, that's why the Mets brought him in from what I just talked about, that lack of thump, and we know what he does in short series. Um, I don't think he's necessarily a guy that can can carry an offense for months at a time or whatever it may be, but he's someone that in the middle of a lineup with an Alonzo, a McNeil, a Lindor, a Marte, um, and a Nimmo at the top of the lineup, he's someone that could just kind of slot in and be a guy and benefit from having those guys protecting him, and I think he's going to do really well. You know, like I said, I think this is more a, a move for October, um, trying to you know beef up their power to keep up with the rest of the teams in the NL East, but man. Um, it's going to be really exciting seeing both of those guys, you know, Lindor and Correa, for the next decade plus on the left side of the infield. You know, just got to hope, uh, you know, watching Team Puerto Rico this year, everything's good. You know what I mean? Now you got a, a, another Met, I guess, that'll be in the WBC. But I just, I, I'm like floored. This is something I really didn't think would, would happen. Um, you know, although every, we talked every time the, the Mets signed someone this offseason, right? They, they signed uh, Diaz. We talked about how, you know, signing Diaz probably means they'll lose Nimmo. They're not going to be able to afford to bring all these guys back. And they've brought everyone back. They replaced Jacob deGrom with Justin Verlander. They go sign Kodai Senga for $15 million a year in Japan. I mean, it's incredible. I, I don't know. I don't know if I've ever seen a team in this short a time, like, rebuild a roster like this. And let's not forget, they haven't given any prospects up. They've added, added, added without having to give up any of their farm system. Now, granted, when you have infinite money and you play on MLB The Show like Steve Cohen's doing, makes it a little easy. But I got to give this front office a ton of credit with the, uh, you know, Correa putting them over the top and the additions that they've made, still being able to keep kind of that younger core and that, you know, sustainability that they've talked about. Cohen's backing everything up. And, you know, even to to hear it, to see it now is another thing for Mets fans. And I, I just, I'm floored and it's, it's really awesome. Well, and I think to kind of touch to that, um, even Scott Boris told Steve Cohen, he's like, you don't have the farm system yet. When you bought the team, you don't have the farm system. The first four to five years, you're going to have to spend. Um, and it, and not to say that he didn't the first two years, but I, I don't think he spent to the point of where everyone was like, wow, this is kind of crazy. I mean, now – and not even before Crayo, we're like, well, th this is spending and this is pretty nuts. But now it's just, hey, anything now it's anything's on the table. No one. I mean, we're not talking about baseball. We're talking about North American sports. Mm -hmm. No one's done what Cohen's done in North American sports history. I mean, eight hundred and six point one million dollars combined that they've committed to free agents so far this offseason. So, I mean, they're going to pay right now $110 million in tax penalties just for 2023. That's more than the playing payroll of a third of Major League mm -hmm. Baseball. Um, and I believe the tax penalties for next year are already around $50 million too. So, I mean, he's already essentially put himself out there for $160 million in tax penalties. Um, which I mean, ultimately is a drop in the bucket for Cohen. And, uh, but I, I, I think this is a good kind of spot to shift to where obviously this is all happening for the most part because of the money that Cohen has, mm -hmm. because he's a $17 billion man. Um, but this is also happening just because of what Cohen is as an owner too. Right. And how he runs the show. I mean, when it came out, I, was one of the first ones to report that the Mets had interest in um, Carlos Correa. It was actually just a couple hours before he signed with the Giants. And then it kind of came out, the specifics of that was that Cohen was himself the one that reached out to Boris and was like, well, we have interest in Correa. Let's, what can we do? And at that point, they had kind of found out that um, the Giants were just kind of too far down the road. Right. And that deal was to the point of kind of no return, which seems kind of weird at the time uh, at now. So, uh, but yeah, and then this happened again. So once this deal started falling apart, uh, Boris gave the giants a deadline. He said, we need to hear back from you guys at this point. If I don't, I'm going to start talking to the other teams because this, this wasn't, um, I mean, 
the news gets out there, stuff's agreed upon, stuff like that. But this wasn't, nothing was signed yet. Nothing right. about this was official. Um, so he gave them a deadline and they didn't meet it to um, his specification. So Boris was like, well, I'm going to shop them elsewhere. Um, and Cohen immediately picked up the phone and called Boris. And for all intents and purposes from people I've talked to, this was essentially this negotiation was essentially ran by Cohen. Mm -hmm. um, the negotiations between him and Boris for Crea was, I mean, Epler was kept in the loop, but that was more of a, Hey, this is what's going on. This was, this was Cohen being the president of baseball operations. Mm -hmm. um, that That's what he was acting as. And I mean, kind of, I don't think it's really the first time either. Now that other stuff has kind of came out, it, it, sounds similar to what happened to Justin Verlander. I mean, mm -hmm. he said that Cohen was the first one from the Mets that called him early in the off season to tell him, well, Hey, we're going to keep talking to you this off season. Um, this is what we're going to do. Uh, Verlander made it very obvious in his um, presser that along with money, of course, but that Cohen's vision and just his um, participation in uh, what the Mets are doing was a big reason why Verlander wanted to be a Met and uh, kind of come back full circle on that. We completely forget that uh, the Mets introduced Justin Verlander yesterday. I mean, he's, he won the Cy Young last year and it's, it's old news now. It's, it's, and they signed Adam Ottavino um, later in the day too. And it just, I, it's tough to, I you, you could see it all over Twitter, and it just wasn't Mets Twitter; it was baseball Twitter. Just the sh the sheer disbelief that hey, the Mets now. I mean, it do, does anyone else have a better infield than the Mets? I don't. I don't think so. No. Um, um, and does I anyone have a better starting pitching staff? No. Yeah. Does anybody have a better bullpen? Maybe. But I like what the, you you mentioned, Adovino. That was the thing they had to do. Um, I think that's tremendous. And listen, if they can trade for a guy like Hendricks, and you can now stick Adovino in the sixth, Adovino in the sixth or the seventh. I mean, come on, come. I then you have pretty much every aspect of baseball. You're the best. You know, on paper, they're going to be the best at. And with that, I have a couple of, of the follow ups I wanted to, to bring up because you mentioned obviously what happened with Correa and that falling through, and then also the Justin Verlander press conference. But real quick. Outside of the Mets, outside of Mets fans, outside of New York, the sport's not going to like the Mets. Let's call hmm. that how it is. Uh, the industry is not going to like the Mets. They are, have a giant target on their back. They did already. The Cohen effect already did that, starting from last year and winning 100 games was already on their back. But Cohen now, and presumably, you know, the whole I'm not going to spend like a drunken sailor thing, that was a lie. Thanks for that. Um, but you have to think that the rest of the sport hates the Mets. It's not going to be fun on the road. It, there's going to be, it's going to be hostile. Fan bases are not going to like this, whether they don't like it for the sport, they're jealous mix of both. We've been there, done that ourselves, but now we don't have to worry about that. But do you think that the Mets are ready to be that, that villain, that evil empire 2.0? And you think the fan base is ready for that? Because it's not going to out. Like I said, outside of here, it's not going to be pretty. People are going to be hating. They're going to be hating real hard, but as long as they're winning ball games, I know Mets fans are going to be happy. I'm just wondering if you think that this group is going to be able to handle that now. Yeah. I mean, if Mets fans were around in 1986, uh, I was not go on. Neither was I, but I mean, talking <laughs> to my dad, people that go to the games, fans, anything. I mean, that team was hated. That was universally hate. I mean, you could argue even more so for different reasons mm -hmm. than this team will be. But I, I think, I mean, I think the resentment's mostly going to come from uh, the other owners. Uh, look, this, this makes them look bad. Like I said, the tax penalty that Steve right. Cohen's going to pay for this year is more than 10 teams. Um, that just makes them look bad. It, it doesn't make Cohen look bad. That makes him look like a passionate owner that wants to spend. Um, I think the estimated, they said the estimated revenue for the Mets this year is 450 million. So th there's a good chance that's right. Like right where it's going to be. Well, that's a little less than where it's going to be with the tax penalty. Yep. So, I mean, he's fine with the possibility of taking a little bit of a loss if his team wins the world series, which I think is kind of the bigger point now. I mean, obviously the Mets were one of the best teams in baseball last year, fell short at the end. 
Um, and going into this year after what they had done prior to Korea, that they were one of the favorites to win the World mm-hmm. Series again. But at this point now, when you spent this much money and brought in th- this many superstars, um, it's World Series a bust at this mm-hmm. point. Um, I mean, any anything besides that in 2023 is a d- disappointment. Um, 2024, when you still have Verlander and potentially Scherzer, um, and you know you have Alonzo and McNeil, mm-hmm. again, I, I think both years – if they're not in the World Series slash and or win at least one in the next two years, I, I think that's an ultimate disappointment. And that, that that's a lot of pressure. Um, and I, I think I think ultimately this team's going to be fine with that type of pressure. I mean, you're talking about a lot of veterans on this team and you're mm-hmm. talking about guys that have been through it. Um, Verlander, Scherzer, all, all, uh, Correa all have rings. Um, they've all seen a ton of playoff experience. Um, last year, a lot of the guys that hadn't seen the playoffs for the Mets got a chance to, and they went through that grueling, uh, last of the year. So, um, I I don't think the pressure is going to get to them, but it's certainly there. I mean, that's like you said, that's the target. Now, um, the Mets are the team to beat, um, definitely in the national league and surely in baseball now. So, that's the target on them. And uh, yeah, it's, it really is world series of bust. And, but this is what Steve Cohen said, right? He said three to five years, he wanted to win a world series and he's doing Here's what three. he can to make sure that it happens in that span. Um, all that he can do from his end, he he's doing it. Yeah. And listen, uh, I'm just going to go out and say it. Thank you, Jacob DeGrom. Thank you for walking. I don't know if the press conference had anything to do with the commitment to winning, you know, comment. That's why he said he went to the Rangers, not $185 million for five years. But anyway, um, we saw what Steven Matz spurning the Mets last year did. I think DeGrom was the same thing, or at least part of it. Um, So, you know, it was sad to see him go. But after the last week or so, it's like it's it's an afterthought. Like, I don't even was upset for a few days. Then they saw Verland. It was like, all right, cool. We moved on. And now after all this, it's like, like not even an afterthought. Um, you know, it's it's just more of a like I said, thanks for uh, for for Peven coming off and making him spend like a billion dollars. Um, you know, you mentioned the owner's comment. You know, I think publicly they, they don't like this, right? Because it makes them look bad. But privately, they love it because they're getting the money from the from the penalty. It's all revenue sharing. So I'm sure behind closed doors they like it more than they let on. They're making money off of it anyway. Um, but you know, it, I'm sure from the aspect of Owners don't want to look cheap, and when they plead poverty, it's hard to do that when you have an owner spending like this. We've talked about it before. The Kansas City Royals got sold for $2 billion a couple of years ago, and that's about as small as a market you can get. So if you want to spend as an owner, you can do it. And more than anything, I know Cohen's highlighting that. Um, people keep bringing up the Steinbrenner comparisons. Um, I didn't see George spending you know, uh, as much as some countries on his payroll, so I don't know if you can even make that comparison anymore. But the fire in the wood, a win is there. Um, you know, it's it's pretty incredible. And another thing, obviously, I brought up the ground real quick, but just with the, the the Verlander press conference, I noticed something interesting that Justin said was as far as that he was in contact with the Mets, and he you know let them know, and they kind of contact with each other. They want to see what happened with the ground first, like basically giving the Mets kind of that, that respect to say, Hey, if you want to resign him, like I understand he's Jacob the like giving you that courtesy. Um, so I thought that was pretty interesting and just bodes to more what you're talking about as far as, you know, the Cohen effect and, you know, people players want to come here because they believe in him. I would imagine a guy like, you know, Verlander, even outside the money aspect, you know, if he didn't respect Cohen's vision and how he treats his organization, his players, I'm sure he wouldn't have been waiting around to see if he was going to sign somebody else. I've never heard of that before, but it just kind of goes, I guess, to the cachet of what Cohen's building, building with the Mets and kind of how he handles himself. So, you know, I thought that was super interesting. Um, that press conference went really well. Verlander's a pro's pro, looks great in the 3-5. I hope he has Dylan G for the number, but that's, you know, a whole – uh, another thing we can get into, but um, you know, other than that, I, I guess circling back to Korea um, to kind of put a bow on it. I'm curious what you think, who got the cold feet? Who do you think got the cold feet? Was it Correa's camp or was it the giants? Cause I really don't know. It's probably a mix of two of the two, but it's just so interesting for a deal of that magnitude to get to that was basically punched in. It was on the half yard line. He was in his, in his suit going to the press conference and it, you know, falls apart. I'm just wondering, 
you know, I don't, we'll never know fully, but I just, someone had to get cold feet. One of the sides had to get cold feet and you wonder, you know, if it was the giants more craze camp. Um, it's just like the, you know, the, the conspiracy theories are going to go swirling here, but ultimately, you know, wound up for the Mets. So it's all good, but I'm just kind of curious what you think there. Well, I mean, it, the giants saw something that they didn't like, but it, I think from when he was 19 years old, though. Yeah, I think really? the more interesting thing is that it was that and not his back. I mean, right. It, it's kind of well known that he's had some back issues. Mm -hmm. um, didn't keep him from playing a ton in the last couple of years. But yeah, so for essentially, it sounded like they wanted more time to check that issue out from. Yeah, when we're talking, what, like seven or eight? No, like eight or nine years ago. And Boris is smart enough to know that he had plenty of other teams involved mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that he wasn't going to hold this up because teams move quick and they do other things. I mean, the Mets were had irons in the fire in the trade, the trade end. Um, and it's getting close to the holidays. I'm sure Boris didn't want this to kind of leak into the holidays. Mm -hmm. um, so he gave them a deadline. And he, like I said, he knew he had teams. The twins were right there at 10 years. 285 million which yep. is not far off i mean it's less years than the right. Mets, but right. it's actually more money mm -hmm. um, per year so he he knew that he had other good offers so he wasn't going to let the giants hold his client hostage essentially and i know some fans like to uh badmouth boris but he did, he did right by his client here right, um, right he did the right thing um cray ended up getting a little less money but he was able to sign right away. Right. And the more this lingered, the worse it looked for everyone. Um, so for it to finish up quickly, I, I think was a smart move by everyone involved. And uh, I mean, you, you've got to feel for giants fans. I mean, uh, they thought right. they were getting Aaron judge. Um, there was a good chance. Um, they almost got arson judge too. Uh, but Carlos Correa, Aaron Judge, they thought they were Brand, getting Brandon move. Nimmo. They they were heavy on the yep. Mets, beat them out for him too. They they thought they were going to get a face of the franchise um, some way, and it just didn't happen. I mean, the only winner the only winner in San Francisco out of this whole thing is Brandon Crawford, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah. But yeah, and and now it's kind of crazy that uh, I mean we're to the point where Michael Conforto is arguably the best or one of the best free agent bats left on the market yep. and the giants have interest, but guess who he happens to be his agent, Mr. Boris, yeah, Mr. Boris. So uh, word. let's see how those things go. But yeah, I, I, I think ultimately the giants were the ones that really had some cold feet and Boris didn't want it to hang around, mm -hmm. um, which is the right thing. So, I, I think it's kind of the combination of the two things. I think maybe they renegotiated and he stayed in San Francisco, but that that would have kind of that would have been a tough nitpicky right. Right. grueling thing that yeah. kind of would have got stretched out. And I I don't. That's clearly not what Boris and Correa wanted. And uh, yeah, I I mean I'm sure more will come out as time passed. That's we're only talking like 24 hours then. Right this has really transpired. So, uh, but it, it works out in a hell of a way for the Mets and the Mets fans, because this amazing, I mean, I posted a stat today that 41 players in major league baseball had uh, weighted runs created plus of at least 134 last year and uh, hundred, sorry, 127. And mm -hmm. the Mets have seven of them now, seven, seven out of 41. So you have seven guys, that they can plug into the lineup that were at least 27% above average. Um, wow. That's just, that's just an incredible lineup. Just, I mean, I, I know today it was kind of like you see one lineup and people arguing, it's just like, what well, does it matter? I mean, the, the order of Nimmo, Marte, Correa, McNeil, Alonzo. I mean, I don't think it really matters how, or where you guys you're batting those guys it's just plug them anywhere and that one through five is just as good as anyone at baseball I, it's it's so good um and i think 
one of the things that kind of gets lost in this a little bit is, and I know we have an article that's coming out tomorrow on Metsmerize about it, is the defense. Um, mm-hmm. The Mets have struggled since David Wright was fully healthy yep. to find anyone that is a good defender at third. Um, they thought Escobar was going to be average over there, and he, he turned out to be below average, mm-hmm. unfortunately. Um, and Correa, we're talking about Correa is a guy who's won a platinum glove at shortstop. Um, his defense was down a little bit at short last year, but I mean, you're putting him at third base where he's, he's going to have no issues and he's just so much range on the left, that left side of the infield. And, uh, there's also a stat talking about how poorly the Mets were at bunts or softly hit balls down the third baseline. And, uh, obviously Crea is faster, more athletic than Escobar. So it's just, it's going to be a massive boost for their defense too. And it comes out a perfect time when we're talk, thinking about it, right, with the shifts going mm-hmm. back. And this is what Lindor was talking about. Yep. He was talking about it giving a chance to more athletic players, um, getting a chance to shine and make the plays that they can really make. And uh, watching that left side of the infield now, it's, it's just going to be a blast. I mean, it's it it's really going to be one of the better – I mean – it's not the same defensively as when they had Alfonso, Olerud, Ordonez, and Ventura. But right. I mean, it's it it the offense is there, and there's plenty of good defense with Correa, Lindor, and McNeil. Yeah, it's uh, it's really incredible. Like I said, you know, just a, a guy like that coming and being a difference maker. He doesn't have to be the guy. You plug him in. He's someone that can just kind of do his thing, hit his 20, you know, 22, 25 home runs, driving 80 runs, 800 OPS, hit around 300, and then hopefully get to the postseason and pop off like he does. Um, you know, I, I want to circle around a little bit. You know, we were talking about trades uh, the, the last episode, uh, you know, before all the Correa stuff happened. Obviously, um, you know, there's some things swirling about possibly Liam Hendricks as a, a, a trade fit for the Mets. Um, with the signing of Correa, you would think that uh, someone like a Mauricio or a Beatty or an Escobar or Vogelback uh, could be on the trading block. Um, I would wonder, and out of you know the the prospect guys, the Beatty, Mauricio, who you'd be well more apt to you know hang on to. I know who I would. I would assume you know Brett Beatty starts playing the outfield full time. He's you know you're going to be your future everyday left fielder once Mark Can is out of here, and he can um, platoon with him lefty righty. Um, in left field, if need be, I'd rather take a chance on getting rid of, Mar- you know, moving Mauricio if it means, you know, another arm. But I'm just curious what you think now the Mets will do as far as to make room on that 40 man roster, just in general, if they try and give themselves a little payroll flexibility or anything like that. Yeah. So once all these deals are official, they will need to make two 40 man roster moves. Um, I think, I mean, the big elephant in the room, first off, is James McCann. Mm-hmm. Um, there's four catchers on the 40. And only one of them is optionable, uh, Francisco Alvarez. Uh, right. I, I, don't, I don't think the Mets want to carry three catchers like we've talked about in the situation where you have Vogelback, who's positionless as the DH. Um, so McCann's that guy. Um, I know they've been trying to push him in trades. They've had a couple of teams bite here and there. Um, I think at some point, uh, the Mets certainly don't want to do it, but I think at some point you just have to release them to get that roster spot. Mm-hmm. Um, there's there's still a possibility that they get a deal done, and that, that would kind of be the type of deal um, with the Liam Hendricks because for some reason the White Sox have potentially said they might trade him. The Mets want to get him. Uh, they need a bullpen arm. I mean, adding Hendricks would essentially give them a super bullpen when you're talking about what they have in the back end with him. um, You'd obviously in that deal, you would have to give up someone like Mauricio. Uh, I mean, Hendricks, you would be getting for two years at 30 million because Mm -hmm. once he's traded his second year, his option is no longer an option. It's guaranteed once he's traded. So you're essentially getting one of the best closers in baseball for two years, 30 million, which as we've seen is a pretty good bargain these days. So you'd have to give up a prospect like Mauricio to not only get him, but to help shed a contract like McCann or, I mean, even I think you have to talk about Eduardo Escobar. Mm -hmm. Um, Look, the Mets, there's only so many people again that you can put on a 26 man roster. Right. And I think between Escobar and Guillerme, there's one of those two guys 
Um, it's tough to figure out. It's tough to see both of those guys being on the roster right. simply because neither of them play the outfield. Right. I think if either of them played the outfield, it'd be different. Um, so then it comes down to really what a, what are the Mets valuing? I mean, obviously Escobar has the higher ceiling offensively, switch hitter, and then um, veteran guy, great in the clubhouse. Um, Guillaume is obviously the defense and the ability to play shortstop. Um, I mean, you, you, could, you could find you have another shortstop spot. now. You have another. That's another yeah. thing as well. Yeah. You have it. Not for nothing. If anything, God forbid, anything happened to Lindor, we had to make significant time like he did his first year when he missed the second half of the oblique. You have another all star shortstop. Yeah. So, again, it's like I was. So, are you was, saying we don't have to carry Devin Marrero anymore? Or you I'm almost saying Sanchez? that the days of John Mayberry <laughs> Jr. and Eric Campbell hitting cleanup are <laughs> so far in the rearview mirror, they might as well be in uh, the Smithsonian because it's ancient history. Um, I, it's why well, I just like, I, I can't, I, I feel like I'm stumbling on what I'm saying. Cause it just feels like it's someone turned on MLB, the show, put it on like unlimited mode. And Steve Cohen was just like, all right, let's, let's do this. I'll spend a billion dollars to retool this team in a year after they won a hundred games. And it's to put a bow on that. I don't know if everyone knows Cohen did all these negotiations while he's at vacationing in Hawaii. Um, I made the joke to you before normal rich people when they go on vacation, they maybe like buy a watch, like a piece of jewelry for their wife or something. Cohen had a couple of martinis. He bought a third baseman. So, uh, I think that's pretty cool. And if he, you know, the longer he stays there, like I said, you know, if he wants to trade for a lever, you know, he's feeling happy, right? He's, he's on the beach, the sun, you know, that vitamin D, it really does wonders for people. Go sign somebody else. It's okay. It's just money. It's just, now it's just money. Um, I, I can't I really can't get over just how quickly this happened. And like, believed i believed what he said i believe you know you hear everything that you know he's the, the character in billions that's you know made off of him after last night that guy's real i saw it now for the first time that that killer in billions that I, i've heard about for the last couple of years it showed for now and also i'd imagine that if there was a vote today cohen wouldn't be getting the max <laughs> but uh thank goodness that that vote already happened and he uh he weaseled his way into uh telling him he wasn't gonna spend too much wild yeah and i think um yeah, I think that's where we're at now. It's just like Cohen is that. I mean, we're talking about the Mets being the one with the target on his back. I mean, Cohen's got, he's obviously got the target on his back now. Um, he, he, he went above and beyond. I mean, drunken sailor. I mean, he, he's passed out in a ditch somewhere. He's, he's is he what blacked he is. out. Yeah, he blacked yeah, out, he, woke up, looked at his credit card, was like, what happened last night? Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, yeah, I mean, he's done it. But I think the important part is that, the Mets, like you said, haven't mortgaged the future for any Absolutely. of this. Um, they've made seemingly pretty smart deals. I mean, Lindor's deal looks fine compared to the market. Um, Correa's deal looks fine compared to the market. When I mean, Diaz, again, looks fine. We've talked about all these deals. I, I don't think any of these deals we can talk about be like, wow, this is just the Mets overpaying to get that player. And I don't think the Mets are going to have to do that anymore. No. Um, like we're talking about, the Mets Maybe are building for, for a certain two way player, but we we'll worry about that then. Yeah, yeah, but I so the Mets are and Cohen are building this organization now to where not only from a winning standpoint, a quest to win, but also just um, running it like it should and doing things like they should be done. Um, and having owners that are approachable, I mean, having dinner with Steve and Alex, it's just this is an ownership group. This is a team and organization that players want to come to, not just for the awesome monetary reasons. So um, there, there's going to there's going to be plenty of more really good players that come to the Mets. And uh, Cohen shown now that Otani next year, I mean, may, maybe they're finally out on Devers, I guess. I mean, that, that would be the one. <laughs> You can't oh, sign him man. for 300 million to be the DH, I guess. I uh, guess so. Well, they, I guess they already did that. Instead of trading for him, they just signed they just signed another uh, guy to play third base. So they, two platinum glove winners on the left side. The entire left side of the infield uh, is platinum. It's all platinum. So you, better wear, you better wear your sunglasses if you sit on the uh, first eight, first base side at City Field next year. Wild. Yadi Molina. I know you're managing Team Puerto Rico. Get some infielders. Give our guys breaks. I don't want them playing every game. Please. Please, whoever, Kike Hernandez, whoever you want to do, please, you got to give up guys a break here. I know you were a Cardinal, so now I don't trust you to begin with. 
But uh, got our guys off their feet there in uh, in March. But wow, this is it's just wild. It's just wild. I don't know. I'm still doesn't seem real. I guess when when they do the press conference, when I see him in his jersey, you know, we we get him there. Then then we'll know for sure. But like, this well, is- and I mean that that's what everyone's kind of. Today was the excitement, right? Yeah. Today was the wow. This is crazy. This is real. We got Lindor and Correa on the left side of the infield, and I think the longer we go without the Mets, like making this officially official, the, I mean, the inner Mets fan comes out and they're like, Oh shit, what's going on with these medicals. And so, I mean, that's a legitimate question from Mets fans, which I think we could answer pretty quick is um, yeah. The Mets don't have any issues with them from what I've known. And Steve Cohen already commented on the signing and while that's highly unusual anyway for an owner to um, comment on something that's not official yet, him doing so tells you that the Mets were completely fine with whatever they already saw in his medicals and aren't going to let anything that might pop up tear this apart. He's going to be a Met. Um, if they need to make adjustments, they will. But I, it, it doesn't sound like they're the Mets – doctors are going to have the same issues with anything and it's just a matter of getting him in signing i mean they were out, they were in san francisco um Kraya and boris were yeah. in san francisco getting ready to do this press conference so that we we got to get him to new york do his physical there and uh i yeah I, I don't foresee this being any issues i mean again i guess the only thing you've got to worry about is the holidays. The Mets don't want to carry this into the holidays. So maybe right. they try to ramp it up in that for I that purpose. Say next week, the in between Christmas and New Year's, they're probably going to want to get something done. Yeah. Yeah. You, 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 you just don't want this. And you just don't want it to linger just because, like you said, it's a weird time of year. Now, with everything that happened to the Giants, you just don't want people to start speculating and get worried. But Cohen's also not someone who's made to look stupid. He's not going to put that out, put that quote out, or try and make that deal himself it's, if it's not. Uh, going to happen not you know not worried about the medical it's weird thing it sounded like you said it sounded like on the giant side maybe they, they thought about the deal that they gave and, and backed out a little bit but listen. well and i i mean the one more point on that mm-hmm. the minnesota twins who know korea's medical yep. history better than anyone mm-hmm. um outside of the astros of course right. the twins have the most up-to-date medical information and for a franchise that doesn't spend at all, right, right, we're yeah. willing to give him 10 years and $285 million. Absolutely. I mean, for me, that tells you all you need to know about his medical history, that the team he just played for was willing to spend that type of money on him. So I think that is the piece, one of the pieces that can put ease to Mets fans' minds. Well, I can't, like everyone else, can't wait for that press conference. Mets in April uh, play at Dodger Stadium and in San Francisco. So uh, that's going to be a fun road trip for a lot of reasons. Very yeah. excited. Um, I'm pretty pumped to be the evil empire and have everybody hate the Mets. The Yankees fans seem to really enjoy it when they won everything. So, like, I'm looking forward to that. I'm going I'm not. I'm going to be honest. It's going to be fun. We deserve this. Um, I, like I said, we, you could debate what you think as far as the sport. I think it's great for the sport. Um, you know, Mr. Cohen here is putting his money where his mouth is and then some. He's almost choking at so much money. Um, hopefully it keeps coming. Um, you know, hopefully by next week, like we just kind of said here, there's a, a Carlos Correa press conference, see him in a Mets uniform for reals. Um, and hopefully, you know, uh, another trade maybe for another arm. Um, and, you know, anything there that they kind of, ra- you know, cap off this uh, amazing offseason that it's been. But if anything happens, we'll keep you up to date between now and then. I got one last note. One last thing. Go ahead. One last note. We mentioned him a little bit earlier and didn't um, talk about it all, but Ronnie Mauricio was named the MVP of the Dominican Winter League. Wow. Um, just kind of something to note uh, how well he's played out there. And uh, certainly, I mean, can't hurt his trade value if mm-hmm. that's what they decide to do. And also interesting note, we, we have talked about that he played some third base, but he right. also played some second base. Um, the other day too. So uh, continuing to get that versatility, which we, I mean, even more so now that the Mets have their third baseman of the future um, is important for Mauricio. If he stays with the Mets to see what other positions he plays. 
No, that's great. Yeah, no, he's been tearing off the cover on the ball. He looks huge. It looks like he put like 50 pounds of muffles on between the last couple of years. He looks like uh went from a, a boy to a man like overnight. But you know, hey, Chicago White Sox, take a look, take watch the tape. You know, might be uh something nice. Him and McCann for uh Hendricks. I'll I'll even drive McCann to the airport for you. But uh that puts a bow on everything, I I I think. Um wild times wild wild times I, I don't know what else to say this has been uh the most fun off season i've ever you know can remember as a mets fan maybe you know i go back to like 2000 the winter of 2006 um when they signed carlos delgado and, and a couple of guys like that but like this is this is wild it's great for great for uh mets fans and you know hopefully uh there's not another middle of the night trade uh in the middle of the night here but uh if it's for something good uh then uh, it's fine. We'll wake up to another good news. But, you know, between now and then, I will keep you up to date. But uh, let's go Mets.